your reputation, it takes a long time to create and build and can be destroyed in an instant. Appreciative inquiry. One of the things I've learned from that, you can go a lot further with any relationship if you approach that person with a real sense of respect and appreciation for whatever it is they're doing. I was very uh, iconic and famous and, and got all kind of awards. Didn't really build the business. Unfortunately, when the January the 6th riots were going on, part of the news on social media was Kendall Jenner is heading to DC now with a case of Pepsi. And I think that's the danger that some brands face today. They make some stupid brand move and then all of a sudden they go from hero to zero. Kip Knight is in the top echelon of marketing leaders in the world. Kip's phenomenal career spans decades in senior management and C-suite roles for Procter & Gamble, PepsiCo, KFC, eBay, and H&R Block. He's even been a consultant to the White House. Today, he's an operating partner with TomVest, a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. In 2019, he co-wrote the book Crafting Persuasion with Bob Pearson, another guest of our show. In this book, they outline the secret sauce of high-impact marketing and outreach campaigns. Kip has launched and led some of the world's most well-known brands. Come and get an insider's look at company brands and the perceptions they create as we dive into how marketing really works. Hello and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Kip Knight. Kip, thank you so much for taking time to spend with me today. Thanks, Mark. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. What is a brand and what makes a good brand? Okay, so... Let's pretend that, unfortunately, the human race gets wiped out and a millennial goes by and you have creatures from another planet come down and they're holding up what we would call a, a Pepsi can. And they would look at it and, and they would find it to be an interesting archeological artifact, but they wouldn't know anything at all about what the brand Pepsi stood for. And the way I think about a brand is it's the collective human consciousness of the good, the bad, and the ugly of whatever you associate with that particular product called a brand. So what brands are really doing well right now in your mind? I'm biased toward Apple. I, I've been a Mac user my entire uh, career. I'm an Apple shareholder. I you know, believe in the brand that strongly. And they just go from success to success because Steve Jobs had another really good definition of a brand. Brand equals trust. And if you think about it, among the brands you really love, if I ask you the question, how much do you trust that brand? You'd probably say absolutely or a lot. And I could probably also say, well, are there any brands that you used to love and you don't love anymore? More than likely, somewhere along the way, they broke that trust. And it's like your reputation. It takes a long time to create and build and can be destroyed in an instant. And I think that's the danger that some brands face today. They, they get the wrong spokesperson or they make some stupid brand move. And then all of a sudden they go from hero to zero. But for the most part, if your brand is founded on a real key fundamental insight of a target audience and you're consistently delivering a benefit to that target, you should be able to figure out a way to survive no matter what the outside forces are. So you recently co-authored a book with Bob Pearson, another guest of our show, called Crafting Persuasion. Why did you all write that book? What was the problem that you were trying to solve? I think the biggest problem we were trying to solve is that we were working with the um, State Department on helping the people on the field figure out a way to be more uh, strategic in their messaging. And the specific problem that we uh, heard over and over again is let's say you were in an embassy and the ambassador said, I'd like to get a Facebook posting or I want to send out a Twitter announcement or I want to do a YouTube interview. And they would do it because that was part of the job, but they were frustrated in terms of, you know, I'm not sure I understand why we're doing it or what the long-term goal of this is or who we're even trying to talk to. And we need you guys to come in and try to create some type of a way of thinking about this to frame the conversation so that our upper management, so to speak, quits doing all of these short-term executional exercises and gets more strategic in terms of how we uh, communicate with our target audience. So that was the genesis of it. And, and what we basically did is we took a lot of the learnings that I had from Procter & Gamble, which I, I think 
is pretty darn good at, at figuring out strategic communication, along with all the work that Bob had done over the years with various agencies and companies he'd worked with. And all modesty aside, I, I think it's one of the better books out there if you're trying to figure out what's the best way to create a, a viable, a practical, and yet strategic approach to how you do communication. And it doesn't matter if it's a one-on-one -on -one communication or you're talking to millions, the fundamentals are, are always going to be the same. You talk about the origin of the book, starting with a call to come to the White House. Tell us about that call and that meeting. Yeah, that was, at first I thought that was a prank, but it was uh, 2008. The Bush administration was winding down. I was actually winding down my time at eBay and I got a phone call one night and the individual said, I'm from the National Security Council and America's image is really taking a beating and we're inviting uh, a couple of marketers to come to the White House and talk to the National Security Council about what we can do about it. And after I verified it wasn't a prank, I was you know pretty excited. <laughs> As you think any marketer, I was like uh, a marketer dream come true. Your country needs you come, come help right. us out. And went to the, went to DC and, and went to the White House and went to the cabinet room across from the Oval Office and met for, I think we had about an hour meeting with the actual National Security Council. It wasn't wow. the junior assistants or anything. It was the real deal. Uh, but at the end of it, I just said, look, this has been a real honor and a privilege and a pleasure. But if you guys are serious about trying to change the way that we communicate with various audiences around the world. We, we have to do a better job training the people on the ground. And at that point, I, I'd done a couple of, not a couple, I did a number of seminars at both PepsiCo and eBay on training people how to think more strategically about marketing communication. So we created what we came to call the United States Marketing Communication College, the USMCC. And for about the next decade, pro bono, we taught at the State Department training facilities, several thousand diplomats of various types on how to think more strategically. And, and that was, again, the basis of the book. In the book, we've captured the model and, and, and how it works and, and a lot of real world case studies as well, both, both from the private sector as well as from government. Tell us a little bit about that model. If you think about, any kind of model that's going to be any good for you, you don't want to have to go look it up on your computer or a book or try to remember what was that. It's got to be simple enough that you can carry it around your head. And I could literally wake you up in the middle of the night and you could, you know, just spill it out to me. And so uh, we said, everybody knows their ABCs. So here's the way to think about the model. Five core elements on any communication strategy. A for audience. B for behavioral objective. C for content, and D for delivery, and E for evaluation. But that's in essence the model. And anytime you develop a, a strategy, and, and one of the things we've done is also created a, a template for folks. So if you go to the website that we've created that goes along with the book, uh, craftingpersuasion.com, you can actually go to the exhibits and uh, you can see an example of a template that's uh, got the definitions and also a blank one. And so you can create your own strategy, which the, the big mantra for the marketing college that we stressed over and over again, and I see it violated on a daily basis, strategy before execution. Strategy before execution. So no matter what you're trying to communicate, take the time to really figure out what is your strategy and what are those fundamental questions that you need to answer first. And you can literally go through the A, B, C, D, E. Who is your audience? What are you trying to get them to do? What is the content that's going to persuade them to go do that? How are you going to deliver that message? And what's your success criteria to evaluate it? So this is not rocket science. This is not very complicated. And yet I would argue way too many folks uh, don't do it at all. And, and if you want to go back to the example of great brands, I can tell you that great brands absolutely would check every one of those questions off consistently. So if you take nothing away from else from this podcast, I hope people remember strategy for execution and perhaps our book can help them figure out how to do that. So a lot of companies and marketers, as you said, focus on just content and delivery uh, of their marketing campaign. What's the price that they would pay if they didn't follow the model as you've outlined it? I think a one word answer would be confusion. Their potential audience doesn't 
ever even find out about them because they haven't figured out where does that audience consume their media? What does their audience care about? What would be a motivating benefit for that audience? And it also makes it really difficult for the next team that comes along and is charged the marketing because there's no thread. The reason I'll mention Geico is another brand I think that's done an outstanding job. And Geico, believe it or not, spends a billion dollars a year for one simple message. Give us 15 minutes, we'll save you 15% more on your car insurance. And yet that must keep working for them because they've come up with oh, a half dozen creative approaches I could just off the top of my head give you to just reinforce that message over and over again. So they're very consistent creatively. They know who their target is. They know what their behavioral objective is, buy our insurance. And they've got enough content and media vehicles and they know how to evaluate it. More premiums collected every year. To answer your question, there's confusion and chaos and ruin if you don't do it. And if you do it well, untold riches and success. You choose, which one do you want? That's a compelling argument. Yeah. <laughs> you Where where do marketers or their companies get marketing wrong? What are some of the marketing missteps or marketing campaigns that have really just misfired in the public? A lot of the mistakes people make is, and you see this unfortunately on way too many Super Bowl ads. How many times have you watched a Super Bowl ad? And number one, you have no idea what it's what brand you're talking about. <laughs> number two, you have no idea what benefit they're selling. And number three, you're not quite sure what they want you to do next. Other than that, the agency and the client got to go to the Super Bowl and have a good time. There's no real lasting benefit from what they've done. So look around. You, you don't have to look very far to see examples of really disappointing advertising and in a, a world in which everything is being measured and what's the ROI and, and how do we cut money? One of the fastest ways of decimating your marketing budget is to be non-strategic, to not really be able to demonstrate any benefit from your marketing. And I guarantee your finance friends will come in and go, thank you very much. We'll take it from here. And before you know it, you're trying to exist on price promotions, which is the ultimate death knell for any brand, because unless you are a value-based brand, and, and that's your sole reason for being. If you're down to competing only on price, then pack it up and go home. You're done. What are some of your favorite campaigns? If you go back 10 years and remember the, hi, I'm a Mac, I'm a Windows. Those ads, I'm talking about the Macintosh computer, those are classics. More currently, and a friend of mine actually did these ads, a farmer's insurance. We know a thing or two about insurance because we've seen a thing or two about insurance. Of course. If you think about it, as opposed to a Geico ad, which is primarily talking about what a great value they are, Farmers never really talk that much about price. They talk about expertise. And obviously that campaign must be working for them because they've run it for a number of years. And I'm sure in their research, in terms of name a brand that knows what they're talking about, they would rank high. Capital One is another one that, even though I find the creative a bit irritating, they've really drilled home the idea of what's in your wallet. And if you think about your own habits, you probably only are going to use one or maybe two credit cards in your personal finance. And I'm sure one of the reasons they've continued to do well is that that credit card, Capital One credit card has become the credit card of choice for, for millions of users. So again, my criteria for success is not only does it get your attention, is it focused and memorable? Does it have a meaningful benefit and action, you know, call to action? But what were the business results? And you add all those up. And unfortunately, that's a shorter list than a lot of agencies and brands would, would like to think about. A lot of ad campaigns go nowhere and, and they're just a waste of money. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think are some of the misconceptions that people have about marketing? And, and what is the truth that people need to know about how marketing really works? I think the biggest misperception people have about marketing is it forces people to do things that they don't want to do. I think a lot of folks think of marketing the way they think of used car salesmen. They're pushy, they're loud, they're arrogant, they're insensitive. And to me, the mantra that every marketer ought to have is, and this is basically what gets drilled into you at Procter & Gamble, our mission is to listen and respond to the voice of the customer. And if you think about it, if you've got a C-suite of executives and you're sitting around the table, the sacred duty of the marketer is to represent the consumer at that table. And with all due respect to the other functions, nobody else is going to speak up for the consumer. If marketing doesn't listen and respond to the voice of the customer, nobody will. With all due respect to the finance folks, that's not their number one goal. They're, 
they're not really thinking about that. Neither is operations, neither is IT, neither is legal or HR. The only function that is there to represent the consumer is the marketing person. All those functions are really important, but I believe the marketing one is especially important because of the importance of making sure that the person who makes it all possible, that is the ultimate consumer, if they're not strongly represented and that's not top of mind on everything you do on a daily basis, then uh, the, the brand's at risk and the business is at risk. And again, Procter is, again, I'm, I'm such a, continue to be a big fan of that company. Great company. Uh, their their uh, mission is touching consumers' lives every day, which they do. They've got products that I guarantee you've used throughout the day, week, year, your life. And uh, a lot of their success has been because they've just got that consumer front and center on every single thing they do. And it, it trumps anything else in terms of how much money can we make or how much social media presence can we generate or any of that stuff. Just making sure people feel like they've got a, a trusted partner with that brand is top of mind. And, and that's what great marketing is. And that's what great marketers do. Any final thoughts that you want to share with us? Appreciative inquiry. And one of the things I've learned from that is you can go a lot further with any relationship if you approach that person with a real sense of respect and appreciation for whatever it is they're doing. And one thing my mom taught me, and this has worked almost every time. I've had one or two instances where it didn't work. <laughs> but if there's something you really want to learn about and there's an expert, if you go to somebody like I, I go to Mark and I say, Mark, I understand you are really good at doing podcasts and I would be so appreciative if you could just teach me one or two secrets of your success. It's amazing. I've asked that question hundreds of times to very powerful people. And most people are really flattered if you approach it in that way. So mm -hmm. the one, one thing I would leave everybody with is what can you do in terms of appreciative inquiry? with the people that you either know or would like to know to, to enhance your own knowledge of the world and maybe make them feel a little bit better in the process. This world needs a lot more appreciation for, for everybody. And if we all do it on a daily basis, I, I think we might be a, a little bit more fun place to live and work.